very delighted to, to have uh, uh, Moon Curry up, up here from, uh, from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, this is uh, the, the second of our, our IPID awards we'll be giving out uh, today. Uh, many of you were here last month when, when Alan Roses received his award, and, and today we're giving the award uh, for the IPID award for, for patient service. And so, as many of you know, uh, four years ago, when a number of us here in the audience uh, started the Institute for Pharmacogenomics and Individualized Therapy, we wanted a way to recognize those people who have uh, made significant, sustained contributions to make our life easier. And the people who have, have made it so that we can do our work in a, uh, a much more expeditious fashion than we could have uh, without their, their hard efforts. And so, we're, we're very pleased uh, to give uh, an award for, for patient service which is really honoring a, a person who has made uh, significant contributions to uh, empowering patients and who champions patient focus uh, in the advancement of, of rational drug therapy. And this is a, a, a broad area of, of award, um, but Dr. Moon Curry is the recipient of, of uh, this award. Um, Moon is the, is the founding director of the Center for Disease Control and Prevention Office of, of Public Health Genomics. The office serves as the national focus uh, for integrating genomics into uh, public health research and health promotion. He also a, has a leadership role in the Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences at the National Cancer Institute, and is one of those people who uh, is able to work in, not only work in two places, but work for the government in two places. And so obviously he has a, a very strong uh, spine and gag reflex. <laughs> uh, Dr. Curry trained in medicine and in pediatrics at the American <laughs> University of Beirut, uh, Beirut and received a PhD in human genetics and genetic epidemiology from Johns Hopkins University. Uh, he's board certified in medical genetics. He has over 400 published uh, books, uh, book chapters and articles. He's an adjunct, uh, as well as your website, uh, he has a, uh, uh, he has an adjunct uh, professor uh, in epidemiology uh, at uh, uh, Emory University uh, School of Public Health and is an associate in epidemiology at the Johns Hopkins uh, School of Public Health. So Dr. Curry has had a, a strong, has been really a strong advocate for objective assessment and application of genomic information. And his vision to generate objective assessment of application potential for genomic in, uh, information has really empowered patients and their clinicians uh, by providing them with a multidisciplinary consensus around individual tests. Now, many of us uh, view um, his efforts as e at EGAP and GAPNET and many of these others as really a painful dose of reality. And many of us are saying, well, why would we give an award for someone who is holding <laughs> us to such a high standard? But it is just that standard that is causing us to really think, what kind of science are we doing? Are we doing the kind of science that will get us published, or the kind of science that will lead to true changes, sustained impact on patients? And so it's that sort of effort that is really um, causing us to, uh, to, to make this, this sort, of, this sort of, of work. And the information ultimately causes us to be um, more informed participants in the healthcare uh, choices. So, Lou, if you could come up for a second here. So, we can, uh, oh. you, you can, well, you can stand there. <laughs> you can smile there. <laughs> My time? Three. Oh, no, three. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, here, we'll hand over to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I'd like to uh, introduce that story. Thank you. Thank you, Howard, for the kind words. Um, and I appreciate the invitation again. I know when I came here two years ago, it was just before you guys moved into uh, the new building. And uh, um, as I got the invitation again, I said to myself, but they heard me. And I put my thoughts together and my slides, uh, independent of what I did two years ago. Then I went back and looked at my talk from two years ago. I hope there's not too many people in the audience from two years ago, because <laughs> I feel like a broken record uh, saying the same things over and over again. But I, I truly appreciate the honor. And uh, being a person who hasn't worked directly for patient service, uh, this is doubly rewarding for me, because uh, we in the front line of public health and population efforts, sometimes we don't somehow see the immediate benefit of our work to uh, a patient. So uh, 
I appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here. This is, I changed a little bit the, uh, the title of my talk. I have lots of slides, but I usually speak fast, uh, so we can try to cover all that needs to be covered. Um, what I'd like to do today is cover these four areas. Um, sort of 2010 is a good year for genomics. Uh, we've crossed a certain threshold uh, of discovery and like to go very briefly over that. But the, the main message of point number one is that there is a, an enlarging gap between where we are with the basic science and its health impact on people <coughs> right now. And, <clears throat> and um, I want to give you a sort of primer for public health in the year 2010. Uh, sort of the reality that's further removed from genomics and how far away from <clears throat> genomics and the excitement and the basic science <clears throat> that the essential public health functions and services are having to deal with. Then I'm, I'm a uh, bridge builder. I'd like to build the bridge between public health and genomics uh, that essentially tries to close the gap between where we are right now with basic science and where we want to be, which is making an impact with using this technology on population health. Then I'll end up with uh, sort of the priorities for action, both from a clinical and public health perspective. I'll, there will be a heavy dose of case studies throughout the presentations, not too many from the pharmacogenomics field, unfortunately, uh, but uh, we can imagine how uh, my talk would apply. Uh, I've had the honor of working with so many people in this room. I want to single out Jim Evans. Uh, you can now hide, because uh, you will see some of your slides here. Uh, Jim uh, sends me practically an email every day because we both work in the same journal. And uh, as an editor-in-chief, he, uh, <clears throat> he's a good slave driver, and uh, he works me to death. But uh, I enjoy working with him, and we've um, worked together in a number of uh, public health genomics forums. Uh, and you could see some of your slides and ideas reflected here. So where are we today? It's, um, you know, this is sort of a... It depends on when, when the clock started, I guess. If you count in uh, 2000 when they finished the initial sequence uh, or the draft sequence of the genome, now we're the human genome at 10. This was from the April issue of Nature. But where we are right now is a tremendous uh, bolus of uh, discoveries. This is from Terry Manolio's paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. The world of GWAS has uh, essentially given us uh, a window on genetic susceptibility and genetic factors and all kinds of diseases and traits and phenotypes. And uh, there is a GWAS catalog that you can search, uh, but I think now we're in the hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of stable hit, hits. Um, I like to use this slide because when Francis wrote this paper in 1999, he had the year 2010 in mind. And we are now in the year 2010. I wanted to share with you his vision and to tell you that we are both close and far from that vision. Uh, so in, in 1999, Francis Collins, the current director of NIH, envisioned that in the year 2010, uh, the world of personalized medicine will be a reality. And he envisioned that this fictitious patient named John, who's 23 years old, who would be coming to his healthcare provider for a checkup, would have his genetic printout uh, with a a targeted, uh, personalized primary prevention effort, secondary prevention, early detection for colon cancer, and therapeutic uh, pharmacogenomic-driven cholesterol-lowering drugs because of these numbers. Of course, the, you know, forget what the genes are but, and the relative risks and lifetime risks. And I and many others uh, you know, thought that this was a nice vision to have, but in order to get these numbers, in order to... Uh, you know, um, uh, do the trials that are needed that we needed probably more than the 10 years that he set out as a time horizon to get there. Uh, certainly, the reality today in the world of medical practice uh, is still in the world of medical genetics. We're still dealing with uh, the world of single gene disorders and chromosomal anomalies, and there is, has been a tremendous growth in both the industry and the labs and the testing that has occurred over the last 10 years. And this is uh, from the Gene Test website from the University of Washington, showing the tremendous number of disorders for which there is a genetic test available. And um, the almost reality that Francis Collins talked about in, uh, in uh, 1999 just beginning to happen. I mean, in uh, Lancet earlier this year, uh, there was this uh, first or, or uh, by now several cases where you have a, um, the 40-year-old man with family history of heart disease and early sudden death who has had his clinical assessment of his personal genome. And if you read this paper by the Stanford group, 
you can see how they struggled with making sense of uh, a sequence of one person to trying to influence clinical management. And there are uh, the pros and cons and the editorials, including uh, uh, some of uh, what Jim Evans and I have been writing over the last few, few months. But it wouldn't be a complete lecture if I don't mention that you know, while we focus on the genome and the sequence and the variation, really the genome is just the beginning. And uh, I think the tools, the biomarkers that are going to be derived from all these new fields, from the transcriptome to the epigenome and the microbiome, and last but not least, this incidental loam, uh, uh, which is sort of a, a jive that uh, Isaac Cohen from uh, Harvard uh, talked about this uh, when he wrote that uh, JAMA piece a few years ago. We have lots of data, data points we don't know what to do with uh, yet in, in medicine and public health, but we're getting there. So the reality check right now in 2010, there is uh, both... Uh, pros and cons and uh, the, the, the amazing uh, basic science and biological insights are not matched by the applications. And uh, again, this is one of the papers uh, with Jim Evans, the reality check. We are labeled sometimes as the naysayers in the field of genomics. And I don't think we are naysayers. Is that right, Jim? We are reality checkers, uh, more or less. And, um, you know, for uh, it, it's me, amazing to me that I would uh, get an award for being a reality checker, but thank you, Howard, for that. Um, it's, uh, it's gratifying uh, because I, I want the field to succeed, and I, I don't want this, uh, the backlash from uh, the, the true naysayers who I, I work with in my, uh, some in my own institutions and others that really don't believe in the power of genomics. I do believe in the power of genomics, but I do believe that it has to be evaluated systematically that you would evaluate anything else in medicine. So no generic exceptionalism, we'll get to that. So we have a tremendous evidence gap between where, uh, what the basic discoveries are telling us and where we want to go with them. And I'm not the only one who's written about the evidence gaps and dilemmas. There has been a smattering of such uh, papers and, and treaties and uh, uh, commentaries of, on, on the long run. In the world of dr new drugs, and uh, you know, the, the, the drug industry has the a usual way of carrying through phase one, phase two, phase three trials, etc. But what, for the world of testing, uh, there are no real hardcore rules. I mean, FDA, the, you don't even have to go through an FDA approval to get uh, tests on the market, although that, that may be changing if the FDA exercises more it's of an oversight authority that they want to do. But, you know, you ask these basic fundamental questions about any lab performance, uh, whether you use that test for pharmacogenomic applications or risk assessment or diagnosis or prognosis, it's all the same. Uh, you have to see the analytic performance of that test in the lab, whether it predicts the certain phenotypes you want to predict, and whether actually it changes patients' outcomes. And that is no different from genetics or genomics or transcriptomics or, uh, or anything else we do in, in medicine. So enough for an intro. I want to give you sort of the realities of public health in 2010. Uh, for the last three years, so for those of you who don't know what public health is, I just wanted to give you this uh, quick um, 101. Public health is this, um, uh, this effort that society organizes uh, to both protect, promote, and restore the people's health. So it's very much a population-wide endeavor. And uh, the Institute of Medicine has been writing a bunch of reports on the uh, futures of public health. One in 1988, in which they didn't mention the word genomics in it. One in 2003, in which the word genomics is mentioned at least a few times, at least belonging to the future of the public health. But they talk about the three essential functions, assessing the health of populations, figuring out what people need, developing the policies and the guidelines and and the recommendations that allow us to uh, apply these, thing, uh, these things that we need, and then assuring those services. And the word assurance is very important because we want to assure the services to all segments of the population, not just the rich or not just the people who have the funding to do it, but uh, you know, we care very much about health disparities. And in the last IOM report, they talked about public health not as what I do at the CDC as a government public health agency, but the public health system <clears throat> in order, uh, anybody who works to improve health through a population focus is a public health person. Whether you are working in a community organization, in academia, part of the media or the healthcare delivery system. So really, 
healthcare and clinical services are very much part of the public health system. In other words, uh, people in clinical medicine deal with people one at a time, and we deal with it from a population perspective. A lot of uh, people identify public health with just what CDC does and what state health departments or local health departments do. So when the new CDC director came to town, Tom Frieden from, um, was the commissioner of New York City, he, uh, um, in, at the end, in 2009, he set out what he called CDC's winnable battles over the next few years. And these are areas in which he wants to make an immediate impact on reducing morbidity and mortality. And these are uh, scalable, uh, proven uh, interventions where if you apply what you know, we can reduce the morbidity and mortality uh, in the general population by X or Y or Z, depending on what those things are. So you have HIV, healthcare-associated infections, motor vehicle injuries, and so on and so forth. You can read this for yourself. And he was challenging us. He's a very much of a practical person. He doesn't have a, <clears throat> an eye for the future. He wants to save lives in the next two years. So he's challenged every single program at CDC to tell him how many lives have, have we saved over the last 10 years, and how many lives can we save over the next 10 years. So when my turn came, it was a bit of a struggle here because we're setting the foundation for what we can do with genomics in the future. And I'm still a, very much a future-oriented or, public health activity. And that's why I needed for it to be on a firm evidentiary basis. But just to give you a clue what the world of public health thinks in general, and a lot of our thinking comes from what Jeffrey Rose Sir Jeffrey Rose wrote in England uh, many years ago. This was a reprint of his famous paper. He talked about sick individuals versus sick populations. You know, we in medicine practice um, uh, public health one person at a time. We go after the ends of the distributions, uh, so to speak. So this is the, the distribution of cholesterol in people with heart attacks and people without heart attacks. And as you know, while people at the extreme of, heart, uh, of the cholesterol distribution have a much higher risk, it's tilted a little bit to the right, there is a lot of overlap. And most people with heart attacks come from the, the normal distribution, um, uh, the so-called the high end of the distribution. So there is a dilemma in public health. Do you go after the people with very high risk uh, based on their cholesterol level, or do you go after the whole population, lower cholesterol for everyone, by moving the whole distribution to the left? Because if you do that, you can save more lives than finding the very few people who have familial hypercholesterolemia. So this paradigm has been with us for many years. And in some ways, it's good. But in some ways, it's been bad. Because the, the, the field of personalized medicine, by definition, is uh, stratified public health. You might say, well, this is an oxymoron. How can stratified public health still be a public health effort? And I'm here to convince you that this is the case. Now, Tom Frieden also wrote, wrote this paper, which was just recently published, that has created a lot of uh, uh, stir and angst, both within CDC and outside CDC. And here's what he said. And this is a variant of uh, multiple levels of interventions that uh, public health uh, people use. So he said, if you attack the base of the pyramid, you can have a largest impact on people's health. If you wipe out poverty, increase education and inequality, everything else pays. Then, uh, of course, many of us in public health don't think that we are capable of doing the socioeconomic factors type thing. I mean, it's a, it's a political, uh, economic, uh, societal change. The next best thing uh, you could do in public health is changing the context, i.e. developing policy interventions to make individuals' default decision healthy. So, for example, as part of his New York um, effort, he's going after tobacco, big tobacco to uh, tax them and tax them and so that less people will use tobacco. Uh, another policy change if, uh, you know, we need, you put fluoride in the water and everyone drinks it regardless of whether you want to take fluoride or not. You put folic acid in the food chain with the FDA supplementation of the, uh, the diet with folic acid to reduce the burden of neural tube defects. And you don't depend on women taking uh, multivitamin pills with folic acid. So policy change to him is very important. The next thing is long-lasting protective interventions like immunizations that happen in a clinical interaction. And then clinical interventions are the next. And then counseling and education. A lot of what we've done in public health so far has been in educating people. And what he's saying to us, look at the whole pyramid. Develop for each problem you can intervene on 
uh, different uh, attacks on the pyramid. Go after the policy changes, uh, change social, social determinants of health. Where does genomics fit in all of this? Mostly genomics fits at the top of the pyramid so far. So it's been a challenge to try to uh, rise to. And I, I think uh, I'll tell you uh, in a few minutes that I think we are succeeding in how to do that. So what is public health genomics and why do I make a big deal out of it? So right now, there are really three models for moving discoveries into practice. The first model, which is uh, I think what's happening in this country right now, is the status quo of what I call premature translation. Things move into practice well in Italy. And um, <clears throat> you know, it's a model that we are all proud of because it's part of our uh, innovation uh, interest and it's a model that stimulates innovation but may cause harms because we don't know things will move into practice and forget about genomics for a minute. It's part of that. And um, on the other hand, uh, there is another model where you put the, thre the evidentiary threshold so high that things are lost in translation. Uh, it, on the good side, that ensure benefits. Uh, by the time you study things to death and you do you know, 200 clinical trials, you've uh, already made sure that there are no harms that can, can happen. But uh, you, know, you, you basically end up losing a lot of things. And by the time you, you uh, integrate th things into practice, you, uh, you could, could have saved a few more lives. So what public health genomics uh, represent is that finding the right balance, the sweet spot between one and two, uh, by creating the processes uh, and the, the, the knowledge and the wisdom to know the difference between one and two, and then the capacity and the resources to act. And it's a, it's a fine line, and uh, as um, uh, Howard alluded to, EGAP has been both uh, revered and hated at the same time because they were trying to find the right balance uh, in, that, uh, in that endeavor. One example of premature translation is the whole field of personal genomics. I mean, going on the internet and buying your own genome right now, to me, is a premature thing. It's a waste of resources, both for the individuals and society in general. And we held a meeting in 2008, um, uh, the proceedings of which are published in Jim's journal. Um, and uh, actually, I, this reminded me because uh, Jim himself went on the hill not too long ago and testified as part of a committee on energy and commerce. And maybe you can tell us in the Q&A how that hearing went because I only saw it online. It was an interesting uh, process where they dragged these companies to uh, Congress and grilled them because there was a... Um, a uh, kind of a GAO report that uh, investigated their practices and ended up with revealing a lot of uh, uh, atrocious practices, but you can find that for yourself online. On the other hand, lost in translation, this is a story of medicine today, health disparities. These are just two examples from the field of genetics um, where we know we can help, actually one example from genetics and one example from uh, the world of uh, aspirin. We know people need some services and they're not getting them. And forget about genetics. Uh, there are many, many things we need to, to do in, uh, to prevent and cure diseases, and we're not doing them, or we're not doing them enough to penetrate the whole population. So what is public health genomics? It's that sweet spot. It's a multidisciplinary field. Uh, and really, the disciplines that focus on public health genomics range from both the basic science all the way to sociology and ethics and economics and so on. Together, they bring in the uh, this collective knowledge base to effect that responsible uh, uh, translation of genome-based technologies to improve population health. So uh, when I was here last time, I think I was new at mapping out the translation highway, uh, which has now been uh, translated to death. I've written so many papers on this. Uh, but um, the good news is that people are talking about it a bit more. They're mapping out um, resource expenditures and research. I'll show you uh, the data in just a minute uh, on this. So we, as we go from a discovery to a promising application to an evidence-based guideline to integrating it into practice and then showing how it can reduce the burden of that disease at the population level, uh, facilitated by a process of knowledge synthesis and brokering, you go move from the basic to the clinical and the population sciences, and you do work in this T1 to T4 space. And uh, at the time I was here last time, I just published this paper that shows that, uh, based on the literature alone, that most of the work, um, I guess I'm not seeing here. Um, I think it disappeared. Oh, it came back. 
So most of the work is in human genetic research, and this is based on uh, more than 300,000 abstracts published in the mid-2000s in uh, genetic literature. Of course, I didn't read every single abstract, but we, uh, we tried to map them out. Most of them are either discovery or early translation, the so-called bench to the bedside. But once you go beyond T T1, there is very little research that show us how we can use this information to actually develop an evidence guideline, and certainly not to how to use it in practice and show that it, it's doing more benefit than harm. Now, this paper has been getting a lot of play. It was just published in Public Health Genomics, a journal, in which, uh, as part of my NIH tenure, I actually took a look and we mapped out all cancer genetics research funded by NCI in one year. This was 2007 and mapped it into discovery, early translation, and so on. And as you can see, same numbers. About 2% or less are uh, T2 and beyond. There was one uh, funded grant that looked at outcomes in the real world, uh, and I'll show you the result of that study in just a minute. So it's not being funded. That's why it's not being published. Uh, so there is a one one to one correlation. So I want to sort of uh, expand and expound on the priorities for action that uh, for public health genomics, which is, as I said earlier, it's a team sport. It involves the collaboration between clinicians and people like me in the government and certainly academics like yourself. So here are the three priorities, and I'm going to go around the circle one more time uh, with and uh, giving you some examples of the kinds of things that my office has set up over the last two years since I was here. And um, so, again, it's the three essential functions from policy to assurance and assessment. I'm going to start with this knowledge synthesis enterprise, which is very, very important for me because if you can identify what works and what does not work, you can only, you can do two things. One, you can inform research so that more research can get done uh, for things that may or may not work. And you can move things faster into practice. So then let me start there. So. It, in order to do this, as part of this new collaborative network, we have actually began tracking the new genomic applications that are maturing from the bench to the bedside. And um, we have a paper coming out, I'm not sure when, uh, uh, in the next few weeks on this, uh, this uh, the gap finder. It's already on our website. And it's amazing to me that we found over the last year or less, more than 200 applications that are not even in the gene test database. Gene tests, remember, is all for single gene disorders. It's mostly the new types of applications that are coming online. This is a screenshot. You can go online and, and look at it yourself. Then two thirds are actually cancer. And uh, from those, there are, they, they travel the gamut from prognostic to diagnostic tests and screening and pharmacogenomics. and and they, they're all over the place. They are the new biomarkers uh, that, that drive both uh, therapy as well as um, uh, diagnostic and prognostic processes. So that's one, one place where we have launched. Now we know we have this place on the web that captures all the new applications. And uh, next year, the NIH is launching a new genetic test registry in which uh, all test developers will be asked to submit their data on analytic and clinical validity. So we're going to be linking our gap finder with the genetic test registry. Here's another offering that we started actually a month ago, and it's, it's been doing very well so far. It's already indexed in PubMed. I've never seen this before in, in less than a month. So we are collaborating with PLOS, the Public Library of Science, as part of their new offering called PLOS Currents. And we launched a new journal uh, sorry, Jim, not everything can go to genetics and medicine. Uh, it's called Evidence on Genomic Tests. And these are only online publication for people to submit uh, quick reviews on the literature for genomic tests or any genome-based tests for analytic validity, clinical validity, clinical utility by intended use. So I expect at least five or ten submissions from this group by the next month because they, they are not that difficult to write. We already have six or seven. There are 15 that have been promised. And you can get a, a line on your CV because they're already indexed in PubMed. And uh, so try it out. Uh, here's one on KERAS, Mutation Analysis for Colorectal Cancer, Pharmacogenomic Applications. We, our group at CDC kind of had to jumpstart the effort. So I commissioned four or five people from my group to f write for uh, four entries. And 
now they're coming, so I, th I think it won't all be CDC, I hope. Um, but the biggest bulk of the work in knowledge synthesis has been done by the EGAP working group over the last five years. This is an effort that I started long before I thought about these other processes because I, it was at the time where I was becoming frustrated that uh, you know, the, the translation highway is kind of constricted in, in, in the middle. And I wanted to both show the gaps, so hence the term EGA, but also to move a, uh, to show a movement from evidence to practice, which of course hasn't happened yet. It's an independent panel, not too unlike some of these evidence-based uh, groups that are out there. It does systematic reviews. Unfortunately, it's slow and cumbersome, although they're looking at different ways to accelerate this process. And they've been publishing uh, all the recommendations in genetics and medicine. They've borrowed, um, some of their uh, methodologies from other evidence-based panels, like the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, and the, uh, there is another advisory committee that deals only with uh, newborn screening. The NIH does consensus panels. Uh, the U.K. has the NICE uh, recommendations. But all of these do the same work. They have an independent jury that commissions reviews using highly uh, uh, directed uh, evidence reviews. Here's one. And it's the Oncotype DX story, which has created a lot of um, stir last year because many people think this is ready for prime time. And EGAP obviously returned an insufficient evidence. So this breast cancer gene expression profiles, it's a prognostic test used in treatment decision making. Women with stage one or two, no negative breast cancer. And uh, they're using the microarrays basically to predict the likelihood of cancer recurrence to assist in decision making on use of chemotherapy. So as what they do with each one of these reviews, they construct an analytic framework. Obviously, there are no clinical trial data. This is number one, showing an improved outcome. But they construct a logic model that says if you do two, three, four, and five, essentially you construct a chain of indirect evidence. So not everything has to have an RCT, although an RCT is being done on, on this right now. And here's what they came up with. Uh, at the time, there were three tests they looked at. Uh, and they looked at the analytic validity, the clinical validity, and the utility uh, of these tests. And uh, while these tests are good on the analytic performance and a little bit on the clinical validity side, the inadequate or insufficient evidence was seen in mostly affecting the outcomes of patients. So this is what they return, insufficient evidence to make recommendation for or against the use of tumor gene expression profiles to improve outcomes. Not very satisfying. Although at the time, already many groups were, have already adapted, uh, adopted Oncotype DX. But if you read between the lines, essentially here, what they said is that, you know, there are con other contextual factors, that there is potential benefit, but couldn't rule out the harm. Clinicians can decide on a case-by-case -case basis. What is that? They're waffling a little bit. So counseling, educational materials. So Insufficient evidence is not very gratifying, as, as you can all, I mean, I can all attest to that, because I want a firmer answer. But sometimes that's all you get. And the, the US Preventive Services Task Force has actually been doing evidence recommendations for more than 25 years in areas primarily outside genetics. And last year, they took on the concept of insufficient evidence. Remember, Diana Petiti and the group last year were attacked ferociously when they came out with an insufficient evidence that breast cancer screening between the ages of 40 and 50 will change outcomes. And everybody attacked uh, the task force, including our own government, which distanced itself from the recommendation somehow. But what they, she said in this paper, decision makers do not have the luxury of waiting. Even though evidence is insufficient, the clinician must still provide advice. Patients must still make choices, and policymakers must establish policies. So in that same vein, uh, I think the EGAP working group, and this is a paper that just appeared, I think, last week in Genetics and Medicine. Is that right, Jim? Uh, by David Vinstra, who is um, uh, on the EGAP working group at the University of, uh, he's from the University of Washington. They're beginning to use modeling data and decision analysis frameworks. Please read this paper. It's very interesting. And what they essentially try to do is look at the amount of uncertainty in, you know, when you have insufficient evidence, but then they analyze all the available data for the risk benefit profile. And depending on which part of the bucket you fall in, they are saying, well, in some cases when the uncertainty, the amount of uh, uncertainty is so high uh, and the, the, the risk benefit profile as determined by 
your, all the data combined together, we shouldn't use, actually, because we need to conduct additional research. If you look at when the amount of evidence is low and the risk-benefit profile is favorable, so it's appropriate for use in clinical practice. But then there are shades of gray that they identified. Now, what, uh, what I've done in uh, a, a paper that we have now also been publishing in, in conjunction with, um, uh, with David Wienstra's paper, I wanted to simplify uh, this approach and say, well, could we come up with a three-tier classification? The one that's ready for implementation per an evidence recommendation, the one where we actually want to discourage use pending data, and then there is this gray zone of informed decision making where you actually have adequate information on the analytic and the clinical validity of the test or the application, promising but not definitive information on clinical utility. Now, very few things should fall in tier two. But, you know, I, I, I think it all depends on how we interpret this. So what are some examples of what's in tier one? I had to rack my brain to come up with some of these examples. But most of them fall in the, in the traditional single gene disorders. I'll give you the example of uh, um, colorectal cancer and Lynch syndrome uh, in just a minute. So their numbers are, are a handful, but the numbers are growing. So certainly testing for a back of ear side effects in HIV treatment with HLA, Testing, Alan was here last month, so he must have told you about the Abacavir story from GSK, uh, or maybe not. Um, that, that was a good success story. Uh, the things that fall in between uh, that encourage the informed decision making, well, I mean, think about the whole practice of medical genetics today and the use of family history. Uh, most of it falls in tier two. And I see Jim Wensing here, but we can have a healthy debate on this. Uh, when the NIH consensus panel last year determined that there was insufficient evidence to use family history in clinical practice, that's when I hit the roof. If you, I mean, because I said, wait a minute here, that can't be right. You know, we've been using family history for ages and millennia. What they're saying is that we don't know if we use family history outside single gene disorders, primarily for, you know, people in this room, you know, for risk assessment and, and screening, whether or not if we use it, we can actually improve clinical outcomes. CDC is actually doing the only clinical trial, randomized, on family history. Uh, I'll, I'll share some. I don't have data because it's, it's still being analyzed as we speak. The, uh, the, this, the stuff we want to discourage is, for example, personal genomic tests and many of the new biomarkers that are in that gap finder, the 200. I mean, because we, don't, we haven't established the clinical validity, the genotype-phenotype correlations. How can we use them in practice? So, you know, we can have a healthy debate on this. But if we're able to come up with a simple classification that providers and programs can use in practice, and that's a big if, and we'll have to see whether EGAP can rise to that challenge or GAPNET can rise to the challenge, then it becomes easier to supplement, uh, implement in practice using what works and what doesn't work. So over the last few years, we at the CDC have funded a few <clears throat> states to develop model programs. I mean, the, uh, the two that we are currently funding are Oregon and and Michigan, and uh, they're struggling to figure out what to do. Let me tell you briefly the story of BRCA1. I know this is not pharmacogenomics, but uh, it qualifies to show you the lag time between initial discovery and translation. <clears throat> so the gene BRCA1 was discovered in 1994, although many, many groups jumped on the bandwagon and said, let's uh, use uh, BRCA1 testing. The task force, the US Preventive Service Task Force, said, um, essentially is like functions like EGAP, took 11 years to come up with the, the, the evidence. And even post-task force, I'll show you some data on T3 and T4 that shows now in 2010 how badly used or misused BRCA1 is. So for those of you who don't know, if you are one of these uh, um, uh, carriers of mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, your lifetime risk for breast cancer is much increased, and ovarian cancer uh, as well. And what the recommendation of the task force in 2005, <clears throat> if you focus on the second recommendation, <clears throat> the first one essentially they're saying, don't do it as a general population <clears throat> testing, that only a subset of women whose family history is associated with increased risk of deleterious mutations should be referred for genetic counseling because you can do more benefits than harm. The recommendation has a rating of B, meaning it's not the highest rating of A, but that's good enough because there was no randomized clinical trials. I understand that, but I think B is good enough for me. 
what they're saying, if the family risk is high, then the percentage of people will, will, could be tested for um, BRCA1 will be much higher, about almost 10%. And this is their definition of average, moderate, and high. You can read those uh, uh, for yourselves. And, you know, they didn't come up with this. They reviewed the literature. And by 2005, there was a large body of literature on BRCA1 testing and BRCA1 genotype-phenotype correlation. So when I come back to BRCA1 later when we talk about data in that third bucket, so hold your thought for a little while. Let, let me switch to EGAP, uh, Lynch syndrome recommendation. So what is Lynch syndrome? For those of you who don't know, Lynch syndrome is a, an autosomal dominant set of conditions that um, is associated with the colorectal cancer. So about three to five percent of <clears throat> colorectal cancer is due to these uh, autosomal dominant conditions. So last year, based on two reports, these are two evidence reviews published, one by HRQ and one published uh, at the same time as a recommendation. They came up with the following uh, uh, EGAP recommendation statement. So the EGAP working group found sufficient evidence to recommend offering genetic testing for Lynch syndrome to individuals with newly diagnosed colorectal cancer to reduce morbidity and mortality in relatives. So if you dissect this into the two pieces, what they're saying here, up to that point, people were applying all kinds of criteria like the Bethesda criteria and combination of family histories to find Lynch syndrome. But what they're saying here is that all cases of colorectal cancer in the population should be screened for Lynch syndrome. And there are uh, lab tests for how to do this. Uh, because if you find the 3 to 5% of them, then you can cascade to help the relatives. It doesn't say anything about helping the patient who has colorectal cancer with Lynch syndrome. So we recently had a meeting um, at the CDC talking about how to implement this uh, recommendation nationwide. It's not easy. So Heather Hampel, who's uh, from uh, Ohio State University, some of the pioneers in Lynch syndrome testing and screening, made some uh, um, calculations for us that uh, basically a tier one recommendation, if, if we're able to find all these cases, there are 150,000 new cases of colorectal cancer in the U.S. every year, and uh, you, know, you do the math, you find out that you can serve at least 12,000 relatives. Many of these relatives have a lifetime risk of colorectal cancer much higher than the average, and they need to start screening much earlier than the age 50, which is sort of applies to most people in this room. So because you can catch um, uh, the colon cancer early, and then you can perform surgeries. What interesting is she threw at us, said, well, here's another thing to think about. All newly diagnosed endometrial cancer, maybe you should go through that too, because about 2.5% two, two of them also have Lynch syndrome. I call it tier two is because we don't have enough data that we can help these people as well. But then the group came up with a whole list of challenges for how we can implement or not implement this recommendation. I mean, the usual uh, issues that we see in genetic services from informed consent to provide the knowledge to co cost and coverage. I mean, you're jumping from one, one patient to the relatives who are in different healthcare systems, the limitations of the testing, whether it's I IHC and so on. So what they were saying, well, this requires a coordinated public health approach. Because if we can do it just like newborn screening, if you leave it to one institution at a time, maybe it won't happen. Maybe if, if public health takes on the lead to do it, yes, we can find 15,000 people nationwide. And the debate is now raging. Uh, these papers have been just published, uh, pros and cons, points and counterpoints, that we are ready, we are not ready. I just heard this afternoon that UNC is not ready for implementing the Lynch syndrome recommendation that uh, I think the group here and the pathology met and discussed this and they decided that it wasn't worth doing, but where is Karen, is if she's here or not? Hi, Karen. So maybe we can have a discussion about uh, some of the problems for screening or not screening on this. So where does this fit in the pyramid of public health action? So obviously, if we leave it up to the clinical enterprise, some institutions will adopt, others will not adopt, uh, we need to educate the providers, we need to educate the oncologists, we need to educate the gastroenterologists, we need to educate the patients, uh, we need to work with healthcare organizations, we need to uh, change the context, and we are actually working on changing the context by adding Lynch syndrome uh, uh, um, healthy people 2020 objectives. This is, these are objectives for the nation that we want by the year 2020 to have a certain percentage of colorectal cancer being tested. We are actually working with the cancer tumor registries in all 50 states to have a requirement to add 
whether or not uh, uh, Lynch syndrome testing was, um, was done for each colorectal cancer patient so that we can track progress from year to year. So should we jump into, into this and say we need a public health screening program like newborn screening, or is that too complicated? Oh, by the way, Lynch syndrome is only the beginning. We have other cascade screening enterprises coming online, like familial hypercholesterolemia and BRCA1 and many, many autosomal dominant disorders. Should public health stay out of it, let the clinicians work, work on it? Where's the T3 and T4 data that will allow us to move into this? So this is what I want to move into and deal with the population sciences. These are the conglomerate of public health disciplines and clinical disciplines and the surveys and ethical data, et cetera, that measures outcomes and processes. And I want to give you some data on some of these indicators. So before I start, uh, behavior and social and communication sciences are very, very important in this. And I just wanted to highlight a, a paper that came out of a group effort <clears throat> that Colleen McBride from National Human Genome Institute has championed, and they came up with recommendations for actions. I happen to be one of the few epidemiologists in that uh, list of authors, but uh, most of them are communication, behavioral, and social scientists. But read this paper, it was published in, uh, in May in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine. Uh, sorry, Jim, not everything gets published in genetics and medicine. But let's look at the data, BRCA1. We are now 16 years post-gene discovery, and you look at this data showing that African-American women with family history of breast and ovarian cancer are essentially five times less likely to undergo BRCA1 counseling and testing than people. I mean, this, what's going on here? I mean, this is, this is data that shows us what's happening in the real world. When we started working with Michigan uh, in 2008 uh, as our model state public health genomics programs, of the 24 plans for uh, in the state that uh, only four were covering for BRCA1 services. Now, of course, our goal is to have all of them cover it. And so we're working through this policy change. Remember, the, the second tier of the pyramid through policy interventions, working with healthcare organizations and payers to get these services covered. Because we have evidence. We have the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force said we have enough evidence. We want to do the same thing with Lynch. And I think we have a much larger uh, hill to climb. This is data that's just been published uh, by Cecilia Belcross from my office. We did a, a national uh, doc style survey. Again, it's going to the American Journal of Preventive Medicine. It's already in press to show the physician's knowledge about BRCA1 testing. These are seven scenarios uh, that goes from low risk for testing to high risk for testing. And we asked the physicians whether each one of these scenarios deserve a BRCA1 referral. A, a substantial fraction, about 30% of physicians, uh, had the wrong answer for very low risk situations, which are one, two, and three. Most of the high risk people guessed it, uh, but there is still a long way to go, even with something as simple as BRC1. I'm not dealing with pharmacogenomics. I know I'm at, in the wrong institute here, but I'm telling you that even with the things that we've discovered 16 years ago, that translation pipeline really takes a long time, and we need to accelerate it. We need to find ways to move it. Here's the long. T4 data that was funded by NCI, and this was just published in JAMA, basically a non-randomized trial that shows it's a prospective multi-center cohort studies of more than 2,000 women with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations, and basically showing over time, and this takes a long time to show that there were no breast cancer diagnosed in the women with risk-reducing mastectomy compared with the women that who did not have the surgery, 98 out of 1372 versus zero out of 247. Same thing with the, uh, the ophorectomy, which is a very drastic surgery. The risk was ovarian cancer was lowered from uh, 6 to 1.3 and breast cancer from 22 to 12%. This is T4 data, and we need that, and it takes a long time to collect. It's not going to be easy to collect. I want to give you, um, this is the, uh, the antidote to this um, NIH consensus panel that said family history, we have insufficient evidence. We have been thinking about family history for many, many years now, and we, uh, we asked the questions, again, in genetics and medicine back in 2002, can, can we use it? And we developed a tool, and we put it in the field. We collaborated with the Surgeon General. We funded a randomized clinical trial to show its clinical utility. And the idea behind family history is that very few, on very few occasions, it signals single gene or Mendelian disorders. For most of the time, 
it's an undifferentiated risk factor, and it's much stronger than many of the SNPs we are discovering for these same diseases. As a matter of fact, for many of these diseases, even if you adjust for the 100 SNPs that have been discovered, family history is still king. And why? Because family history reflects more than genes. It reflects everything. It reflects your social, nutritional, and other uh, encounters. And we think that family history can achieve, if we use it individually, you can achieve population health goals. For example, in Utah, where they focus a lot on family history because of their interest in genealogies, Steve Hunt and, and others have found that in the whole state, 14% of the families account for almost half of the burden of heart attacks in the whole state. So if you target 14% of the families, you can have a, a bigger bang for the buck. Think about that. If in, in diabetes, um, actually Marin Schoener found, and uh, it's been substantiated in others, that most of us, and you can pull your own uh, data in your own family, first degree relatives with either cancer, diabetes, or heart disease, I would say more than 50 or 60% of people in this room will score positive on this. In our randomized clinical trial, 80% of people had first degree relatives because they, these are common conditions and they increase your risk. What do we do about it? Diabetes is a case in point, which I'll, I'll give you that. We've even done some modeling on colorectal cancer screening outside Lynch syndrome because Lynch syndrome is only a fraction of colorectal cancer. But m many people with colorectal cancer, that if you actually target um, screening, the, even the usual recommendation of more than 50, and you can achieve higher penetrance in, in those people with family history, you can double the number of prevented cases in the population. Why? Because colorectal cancer screening is is not well adopted. About 50% of people get it and 50% of them don't. Here's a recent paper we just published on the value of uh, family history in finding cases of undiagnosed diabetes in the population. So this is a population survey called NHANES, which is a, a federal survey, National Health Examination Nutrition Survey that CDC publishes uh, every now and then. And it's open access. You can all access the data. And what we did in, in this uh, um, in this survey from 1999 to 2004, there were, uh, in 5,000 adults, there were uh, about 2.9% of adults in this survey had undiagnosed diabetes. They didn't know they had it, but because they went in to do the survey, they discovered they had diabetes. So, and we used the Marin Schoener classification of family history, high, moderate, and average. I'll tell you about it. And we looked at models that would predict finding those type 2 diabetics. And essentially, you know, all these covariates from body mass index and, and so on can predict a lot of diabetes. But if you add family history on top of that, and we made some uh, uh, national uh, projections because it's a national survey, you know, there are about 600 mil uh, 6 million undiagnosed diabetics in the U.S. if you do the math. And just by teaching people about their family history of diabetes, you can pick up 600,000 undiagnosed diabetics alone on top of these other variables. Don't ask me how we did the math. It was a complicated math, but you can read the paper. So I hope I just gave you an idea of the kinds of things that public health genomics is concerned about. We're concerned about the, the evidentiary basis of moving things into practice, the using things into practice uh, based on that, and then finding data, data to inform both research and practice, and the kind of data that, that we need to either do education, pro provide policy, uh, the kind of um, data that um, Len has been accumulating on pharmacogenomics, for example, and we talked about this. And my office in, at CDC spends a lot of time doing communication. And for those of you who have been on our website, we have a wide array of tools and databases and and uh, uh, partnerships and seminars. And actually, we have the fourth national conference on genomics and public health coming up December 8 to 10 in Bethesda. So if you all can come, I think we have a featured speaker called Jim Evans uh, who's going to be speaking at that conference. So uh, please come and, and be part of this uh, movement. So where do we go from here? I know we're running out of time. Um, and I think where we should go from here, I think I'm going backwards for some reason. <laughs> and I want to go forward. <laughs> How am I going backwards? OK. Where do we go from here? Let's not go backwards. So we need to build the translation highway. I was gratified to see that Francis Collins and the FDA, Peggy Hamburg, just recently wrote this paper in the New England Journal of Medicine about the path to personalized medicine. 
And this, this is a code saying we're built now building a national highway system. They want to, I mean, one of France's priority for NIH is to invest more in, in this area. But what I want to say is that if you want to build it, build it all the way. Just don't build it enough to tantalize us with more just basic science discovery. Show us the data all the way so that practitioners and people can benefit from it. Because at least for cancer, when we publish this paper, the, the rest of the translation highway is the road less traveled. And use all the available technologies like information systems and medical records and electronic health records because you can do more of these studies much more quickly than if you don't have this technology because that will allow you to do outcome research much more quickly. And do more, fund more of this comparative effectiveness research. I was very happy to be at the, at the right place at the right time last year when uh, the NIH put out, the NCI put out a big bolus of funding around comparative effectiveness research. And I was there to uh, write an, a quick RFA that netted the seven investigator groups, including Duke around the corner from here, to look at outcome research. And this year uh, and next year, there's going to be a new bolus of funding called Patient-Centered Outcome Research. There is a new institute uh, that's been in the process of being formed called PICORI, Patient-Centered Outcome Research Institute, that um, <clears throat> came out as a part of the healthcare reform package that will fund a lot of this T2, T3, T4 type research that hasn't had a champion for funding up to this point in time. So, um, and uh, beware of genetic exceptionalism. This is your slide, Jim. I want to read out what... Uh, this is Jim's whole genome sequence. Um, you know, we, we tend to treat genetics as if it's different from any other specialty, and it's not. And all the reasons that people give that genetics is different because it affects others or the genome cannot be changed, for each one of these arguments, you can come up with arguments from the general medical information that counteract that. And I, I believe in the power of genomics, but let's begin. First, let's not pretend to secure it much more than anything else and treat it you know, with the ultimate, you know, sort of the challenge. But at the same time, we shouldn't treat it the other way around, which means that we give it a pass as far as evidence. This is the, again, another paper we wrote with Jim Evans on reverse genetic exceptionalism, RGE, which is genetic exceptionalism in, re in reverse. In other words, here we, um, we use it as if we don't need the, the kind of data that other um, um, uh, aspects of medicine uh, need, that um, essentially the rules have remained the same, that we, we, we should treat genetics the same way we treat any other specialty in medicine, because we need the data to, to get us there. So I'd like to close with these um, parting uh, summaries. So in summary, the four bullet points here that in spite of the excitement we have in 2010, and there is plenty of it, and I'm, I mean, I'd love to contribute to that excitement somehow, because I'm not a naysayer. I believe in the power of it, but there is still a wide gap between what the promise is and what the applications are and what we can do to improve health. And right now, for both essential public health services or even clinical practice, I would say, there is very little uh, application or demand uh, for these kinds of genomic applications. And I believe that the field of public health genomics, which is, again, a team effort uh, showing partnership between basic clinical and population sciences, can begin to get us the kind of data to close the gap in our knowledge. And the priorities for action today are threefold. One, we need this honest broker function and the evidentiary binning of applications in tier one to tier three or uh, how many tiers you want to use so that we can figure out how things, when things are ready and what kind of research we need. We need to implement full speed what we know while we discourage some applications at the same time. We cannot be blinded to that. There are applications that need to be discouraged because they can hurt people or we can save unnecessary healthcare expenditures along the way. And we need, uh, you know, uh, by far what we need uh, is to assessing the added value of these tools to improve the health of individuals and populations. So I'm going to stop here and see if you have any questions. Thank you very much. One of the difficulties is that the, the field of pharmacogenetics is relatively new. I mean, it's been talked about for, for almost a century, but 
the, the data to actually make this thing is, is relatively new. Yeah. And much of the, of the therapeutic um, aspects, the non-genetic therapeutic aspects, have been based on biologic plausibility. And we're not going back and reevaluating those. And yet with the new applications, such as pharmacogenetics, we're trying to hold them to a different bar. So how do you deal with uh, new information in the context of, of old standards? Because it, you know, what's, what's true right. for a drug interaction yeah. is not true for a genetic test, even though they have the exact same uh, biologic uh, explanation. So uh, I think that's a great point. Uh, I do not want to hold genetics to a higher or lower standard than the rest of medicine. That's what <clears throat> genetic exceptionalism may imply. The, the fact is that evidence-based medicine, which has its roots now over the last 20, 30 years, has actually begun looking systematically at many, many, many practices that we've had. I mean, you know, if you forget about genetics, I mean, uh, things we do that uh, make biologic sense, but if you look at outcome data, they actually hurt more people than not. So again, you know, I'm not trying to use genetics to uh, shape up medicine, but genetics actually allows itself to that kind of shaping up because it's making big claims. I mean, it's a, it's a game changer and a paradigm shifter because we're saying, wait a minute here now, for everything we do in medicine, there is a genomic application. So, uh, so I, you know, before genomics, I mean, if you talk to anyone from the world of evidence-based medicine, they, they tell you they don't want to treat genetics differently. They look at the data. And it happens that in, in, medicine, in genetics, there is very little data to support it. Now, if they're asked to look at the same kind of evidence for non-genetic things, they may end up with the same, right. with the same result. So again, no genetic exceptionalism, you know, both good and bad. Jim, did, are your ears ringing? Uh, hit Jim Evans too much uh, on, anyway, thank you all for coming. Thank yeah. you very much. Appreciate it.